Daniel, welcome. Thanks for having me. I've been watching you since you were a kid fighting in the Golden Gloves. Yeah. Um, and you were here in New York, and you were a dominant Golden Gloves champion yeah. in the area. And now you've gone on to be the best fighter, most consistently excellent fighter out of the New York area in, I don't know, decades? Mm -hmm. Is that important to you? It is, uh, because the culture that Brooklyn provides when it comes to boxing or just entertainment in general, you know, we have a slur of guys who uh, set the tone uh, of greatness for sports and for boxing. So for me, somewhat having the torch to continue uh, the legacy of, of Brooklyn Knights becoming great, I have this opportunity that, you know, is one of many that I think is just that opportunity to make myself great. Canelo's a great champion, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to be annoying right now because I know it must have seemed like you've told this story a million times. Mm -hmm. But believe me, no one's paying it. They, they, you know, <laughs> even people who watch the same show every day, it's, they watch five minutes here and not. Um, you have an incredible story, and I want to hear it again. Yeah. Um, you, I'm watching you in the Golden Gloves. You're a kid coming up. What were you thinking at the time about what your life was going to be, what your career was going to be? Well, it was, it was for me, it was, um, it was a very exciting time as an amateur coming up because I was excelling. I was getting good. I was winning tournaments. And I had hope for myself. And I knew that the more success I would have, that as soon as I turned pro, that that could, would be a continued success and that I would become world champion eventually. Um, so for me, my, my growth was motivating and it allowed me to see myself in bigger pictures. Uh, but, you know, my life kind of had different ways of, of showing me that. And We're going to get to that. Yeah. You, so, so when guys like me, I was on TV already, I was on ESPN too doing Friday night fights at the time, would show up to your yeah. Golden Gloves fights. Were you thinking like, oh... I, I know that guy, and he's, watch, he's coming to watch me fight. Absolutely, and a, a, a lot with a lot of other people. It was just surprising to me because being a kid, poor kid from Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York, making a little buzz about himself and getting people that I see all the time and that I admire. While you're still a poor kid, by the way. These Absolutely. amateurs aren't getting paid. Absolutely. So for me, it was, it was a motivating factor. It was something that I truly appreciated because I appreciate the works of all the guys that I looked up to. So for that to be reciprocated, it was a very motivating factor. And I imagine you're thinking, okay, my mom's struggling, you know, like we don't have money, but yeah. this, is a, this is a way out. Like if I work hard, I can be a champion and life can be better. Yeah. And then it starts going in that direction. Yeah. And I remember you were on the undercard of a, of a fight at some, one point that Lennox Lewis and I were broadcasting, yeah. the heavyweight champ. And we see you and we're at a club. I don't know if you remember this. I do. Behind the velvet rope. Yes. And, and, we, and I pull you in. Yes. Look, right? Yeah, I remember that night like it was yesterday. I remember the advice that you gave me. I remember What'd talking I to Linus. Well, I'll, uh, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what I told you. Well, the first thing you said was, uh, don't be too fond of me because I'm always going to give you the truth as far as my opinion. That was a, uh, the advice you gave me. But an also thing was that when you and Lennox were talking to me, um, you were telling me how if I stay focused, if I apply all my knowledge and continue to stay on the right path, that I would be in this position that I'm in today. And it looked like you were getting there. Everything yeah. was going your way, and you get a belt, and you fight a fighter, a real good fighter yeah. named Dmitry Pirog. Mm -hmm. But you were favored to win that fight. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, you know, boxing is a boxing in that particular fight. Uh, my mind wasn't really 100 percent. And if you know anything about boxing, boxing is a really mental sport. So you have to be in the right mind place, you know, to endure, especially top five, top 10 competition. So at that particular time, I was dealing with the death of my grandmother. She had died maybe three days, four days before uh, my fight with Dmitry Pirog. And I was just in a really bad place. I was young. I didn't really have time to really digest the death of my grandmother. What was your relationship like with your grandmother? She was like my mom. She was a very sweet woman. She was the woman who gave me morals, who gave me uh, just the important things about life. She taught me. She allowed me to always remember one thing when I walk outside the house to represent your family the right way. And she made sure she implemented those things inside me. So what you see now is a reflection of her. So you, and you were always known as a good kid in, 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 in amateur circles mm -hmm. in New York. He's a dominant kid. He's a good kid. He has star quality. Mm -hmm. in, in this area, it's like, boy, it's been a long time mm -hmm. since a kid's been, you know, kept his nose clean and just fought and been a, a great champion and all this. And there were a lot of hopes <laughs> for you. 
Um, and going into the Pirog fight, it's understandable. You lose someone very close to you, your mind's not right. This guy's a tremendous fighter. Yeah. And he knocks you out. Yeah. What happened then? Well, I got a chance to get a dose of reality just about, you know, what comes with a loss. Obviously, you get a chance to learn the things that you've done wrong. Or for me, at that time, I learned that you need to be in a mental capacity, a strong capacity to go into a championship bout like that. That's the main thing that I learned. Secondly, outside the ring, I learned that your circle really isn't that big or your circle is because it is what it is because of who you are. So I got a chance to really see who was in my corner at that particular time. And also just life in general through one loss that I had with Dimitri Pera, I learned so many different lessons. It's made me a better fighter, but most importantly, it made me a better person. And that wasn't even the hardest shot you had to take around yeah. that time. First, maybe it was the third. First, you lose yeah. your grandmother. Yeah. Then Pirog. I don't know what's one and two between, but between right. that. I would guess losing your grandmother. Yeah, very true. And then you got hit maybe with the biggest shot of all after that. Yeah. What happened? Uh, I was diagnosed with cancer. After my, I found out my grandmother died right before my fight of cancer. I was diagnosed a couple months right after. So, you know, I remember being overseas and my legs started coming weak and I started to realize that something is wrong with me. And when I got back home, we went to the doctors and realized that I had a large tumor that was wrapped around my spine, cutting the circulation off the, of my nerves. So in about a week's time, two weeks time, I went from walking with a, a, a cane to walking with a crutches to walking with a walker to being in a wheelchair. To not walking. Yeah, two weeks. So that's how fast it was. And, you know, when I got back home, I was like, wow, something, something has to happen. What about my life? What about my career? We went to the doctors. They misdiagnosed me at first because they gave me an x-ray. So we were under the belief that, you know, if we were taking the pills that they were giving us, uh, that we would be okay. But it kept getting worse. So I went to the doctor for the last time. And I said, hey, you guys got to do an MRI. There's something wrong with me. So they did an MRI, and they seen that there was this baseball size. Uh, a tumor that was wrapped around and it chipped my spine. So literally at that particular point, I was paralyzed, paralyzed from the waist down. So you don't, you, you don't ever connect the two that I've heard you and you're not trying to make excuses, but it seems reasonable to me yeah. that you were dealing with two things in that Pirog fight. One, the, the death of your grandmother, yeah. you know, a couple days before. And then two, who knows how that was already affecting you physically. Very true. Very true. Well, I've had numerous conversations with my coach at that particular time. And I always say, Andre, you know, I got issues with my back. My back is not feeling 100%. And he was always equate that to me making excuses. Damn, Dre. <laughs> it's messed up, man. The man right. is dying of cancer. And you're... <laughs> right. But, you know, it, it turned out to be the worst possible scenario. And, you know, we tackled that situation head on. Uh, once I found out what I had, what I was diagnosed with, I started to look at it as just another opponent. And I took it head on and, and we became the victor. It was tough, you know, the process of learning how to walk again, physically, being weak and not even being able to lift a dumbbell. That's Doctors tell you was. you could fight again? They told me I would never be able to fight again. Those were their exact words. You have to look for another career or something to bring some success to you because boxing is out. And you hadn't made big money, but as you said, from a, for, for a poor kid from, from um, Brownsville, yeah. <laughs> it was good money. You're mm -hmm. seeing six-figure paychecks, but yeah. that doesn't last forever. Absolutely. What was it like financially after you're told... You might die. Yeah. Even if you don't, you ain't going to box again. Yeah. And you don't have your title. You lost that in the ring. Yeah. And your grandmother's gone, obviously. And how's your financial situation at that point? Well, it was, it was all down here from that point on. Once I realized that I had cancer, I mean, we had to come out of pocket with a lot of different things. It was the worst turn for me ever. Uh, wasn't the best at managing money at the time with little advice, if any. Um, so... I had to actually sell my car, had to move back into Brownsville, being a, you know, a top five, top ten uh, contender in the game at that point. So I had to suck my pride up and move back in with my mom to physically get the help that I, that I needed. And just that period of time, it, it really taught me a lot about myself. But, at the, you know, it was so, so, so hard. And as a man, especially the success that I've gained and being who I was at that time, it was very, very prideful to deal with that. So there had to come a turning point at some point yeah. where you knew, okay, I'm cancer free. Yeah. Okay, I can walk. All right, I can fight. Tell me about that. Well, I've always said that I wanted to get back into the sport of boxing. It was my dream. It was my, my place of happiness. 
but I wouldn't put myself in a position if I wasn't 100%. So I remember going through all these different trainings in New York, coming back with Andre. Um, I told Dre, I said, hey, listen, I'm going to do this again. He thought I was crazy for even coming down to the gym with my back brace and my cane, but he helped me. And uh, we was there every day, and every day we would make small progression. And it got to a point where I said, hey, Dre, I think I'm ready to actually spar. And when we sparred, I mean, I got hit by this 130-pounder. It almost dropped me. My legs were, you know. So I was just like, man, do I really want to get back to this sport? There's so many challenges. My body's not feeling 100%. But I just stuck with it. You know, I kept coming to the gym. I kept giving it my all. And we got to a place where I was able to move a little bit better. And then finally, months later, I was just like, you know what, Jerry? I think I'm ready for a fight. So we called our doctors. We called everybody. We got the clearance, which took a long time. Because like I said, the doctors thought I was crazy for even coming back to the gym. So they gave me the clearance after seeing that I was 100%, rather 80%, I don't even know if I'm still 100% to this day, but um, they allowed me to be clear for fights, and when we got back, it was the happiest feeling, the happiest place that I could ever be in. You know, in the movies, that would be depicted, not only did you have to overcome cancer and all the personal tragedy, and you're going broke, and you're back yeah. with your mom, but I imagine the first time you get hit, in the movies, it would be a flashback to Pirog hitting you, <laughs> and you have to also overcome the psychological damage of a kid who, who was a dominant amateur, yeah. rarely lost, undefeated as a pro, yeah. getting knocked out. Very true. What, what was that like? It was hard. It was really hard because I've always been prideful, being, especially coming from where I come from, that we don't lose, and we especially don't lose in that fashion. So the fact that, you know, I was embarrassed to the world, it was... It was very hurtful. When that lightweight hit you in sparring, did you have flashbacks to Pirog? I was embarrassed as well, too. But did you I have mean, flashbacks <laughs> to Pirog? I mean, I didn't have flashbacks to Pirog, but I just, I was very wary and I was very scared because I didn't think I would get back into a place where I would be able to take punches. But eventually you did. Yeah. And you started winning fights. Mm -hmm. And you became a top contender. Yeah. And you get a shot at Peter Quillen, Kid yeah. Chocolate, another, another Brooklyn fighter, another yeah. New York fighter. And I think he was favored going into that fight, if yeah, I'm not he mistaken. Was, he was the champion at the time. He was also uh, one of the strongest competitors that I've ever faced. He was knocking out guys left and right. He sent Winky Wright into retirement. I mean, this guy was really good. So going into the fight, it was, it was brought up and promoted as the Battle of Brooklyn. And that was a very exciting time for me because... I knew deep down inside, I sparred Peter Quillen a couple, uh, maybe a couple years back, and I got the best of him. So all this facade that everybody was seeing, I was just like, man. And then I it was get this ding, guy. ding, oh, round yeah. one. Then what happened? I showed the world exactly what I had. And that grit, that true talent inside, showed up in the... I mean, I was surprised, too, that it happened so fast, but... First round, you yes. heard him. And, and are you thinking, ooh, he's not getting out of this round? Yes, because with a guy like that... I remember him throwing a punch at me, and it nearly grazed me, but the wind, I said, I cannot get hit by this guy. Talking to myself inside the fight. And I was like, wow, okay, how do we do this? How do we survive round one? And then I just hit him with a shot. And I was like, whoa, is he hurt? I thought he was like, you know, playing around, but then we went after him. My coach Andre was like, get up! He was yelling, you know, rumble. That's how cold, rumble. And we rumbled, we were putting out punches in bunches. I hit him with a nice overhand right. The referee seen that he was incoherent, fight was over. You say we a lot, yeah. like, like, um, like there's a team in there. I know, Andre, <laughs> but it's you, isn't it? Yeah. Is that, it's not we went after him, you went after him. Boxing is when you boil it down, it's one on one. <laughs> yeah, very true. I say that too, because I, I feel as if we're all in the ring together. I keep communications with my trainer. We have a very, very intact, uh, relationship when it comes to uh, our communication inside that ring. So we're all in there together. And as a result of that win and your continuing ascension, mm -hmm. you eventually become what was supposed to be an excellent opponent, but still an opponent yeah. for Triple G. Yeah. Gennady Golovkin at the time was considered by some pound for pound the best, but among the best and certainly a dominant right. knockout artist. Very true. Who the only reason he hadn't already beaten all the top middleweights is because he hadn't gotten a crack at all the top middleweights, even though he was champion. Yeah. And you guys at Madison Square Garden, big crowd, undefeated Gennady Golovkin, yeah. Daniel Jacobs from Brownsville, <laughs> you know, right? Who, got, yes, who, who wound up with a tumor wrapped around his spine, mm -hmm. knocked out by Pirog, flat broke, told he'd never box oh, again. Yeah is on the big stage against the most feared fighter on planet Earth. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot to digest, too, because they had made him up to be the biggest 
puncher, the most powerful, the most strongest guy that I could ever face. So forget the challenges that I had prior to. I was getting in the biggest battle that I have ever faced in my career. So that was a challenge in itself, just digesting that. And then when I went in there, you know, the belief started to grow and you can see it round by round. And I'm just looking at this guy like he's not cracked up to what everybody made him to be. And the belief started to grow and I started to become very more confident. I started to push him back. And that's when you guys got a chance to really see what is inside Daniel Jacobs because you've seen a Galani Ganofkin that you've never seen before. Be pushed back for the first time. Uh, not land his power punches like he's used to. And then we minimize Golovkin to a jab. So that, for me, said a lot. Regardless of if people say I won the fight or if they say Golovkin won the fight, it was a close competitive fight. But at the end, I gained the respect of the fans, and that's what I'm happy of. And by the way, you, you, even, you don't even mention this. You got up off the deck <laughs> against Golovkin to finish that fight in a way that some people thought, including you, thought yeah. you won. I thought he won close, partly yeah. because of that knockdown, but you got up off the deck yeah. to do that against Triple G. Very true. It was, for me, it was my proving moment because when I got knocked down, it wasn't a hard shot. It, it, for me, it was more of a push, and I'm, I knew it was technically a knockdown, but when I got up, I said, he's going to have to kill me in order to put me away, and that's the mentality. You could see it from me screaming at him to me flaring up and banging with him. I mean, no one bangs with Golovkin, so... Proud moment for me. You are a very good fighter. You're an excellent fighter. Thank you. The question is whether you're going to be a great fighter or not. Right. And you're going to have to have some signature wins, not just Kid Chocolate, whose yeah. career, by the way, wasn't going in a great direction in retrospect at the time, mm -hmm. and not just a close loss to Triple G. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to win those big fights like against Canelo, and sure. we're going to get to that in a second. But I've called a bunch of your fights as a pro, mm -hmm. and... First, through the first three or four rounds, boy, you look like a pound-for-pound pound type of fighter, <laughs> right? You look like a great fighter. Yeah. And then somehow I pick my head up all after the, the 7, 8, 10, 11 rounds go by, and I go, Daniel's winning the fight. Mm. He's an excellent fighter, but I don't feel right now the way I felt after three or four rounds. Mm. Mm -hmm. And yet against Golovkin, the most dangerous fighter, who, who no one was challenging him at the time. No one was winning rounds from him. You were able to maintain the focus that a great fighter needs round after round after round. No mistakes. Right. Why haven't you been able to reproduce that level of discipline against fighters who aren't Gennady Golovkin? Well, um, due to different circumstances, I can never really say, you know, sometimes people would say, you know, you get up for certain fights because you know the threat that the other opponent possess. To a degree, I believe that is true. Um, but I've also, I'm, I'm grateful with the last performances that I had because I was able to get the experience and go in the full distance to put me in a position at these mega fights now that I have to endure to go a full 12 round competitively. And now you have Canelo Alvarez, yes, which is did. a bigger payday than Gennady Golovkin. Yeah. But a guy who was in his prime. Mm -hmm. Triple G, some people already whispering, maybe he's a little old, but yeah. Canelo, ain't, Canelo is a great fighter who has also improved as time went on, in his prime, the lineal, head, the lineal middleweight champion of the world, yeah. a top three pound for pound kind of fighter, who also seems to get the benefit of the doubt from the judges. Mm -hmm. Austin Trout, Erez Landy Lara, could have gone either way. I thought he won and he got the decision. Mm -hmm. Floyd Mayweather, he lost almost every round. One judge had it a draw. Right. Triple G, the first fight, he seemed to maybe draw, maybe lose, he got a draw. Mm -hmm. Second fight, maybe draw, maybe win, he got the win. Mm -hmm. What are you insinuating? I'm saying that can you win the fight on points if it's a seven rounds to five kind of thing? Is that how you're preparing yourself mentally for this fight? Or do you believe you must beat him decisively? I do believe I have to beat him decisively, but that's always been my goal because even before the Gennady Golovkin fight, I never wanted controversial decisions. I always wanted to be the man in the public's eyes. So that's my mentality going into the ring with, uh, with Canelo. But from Canelo's past, you know, you have to keep that in the back of your mind because the fact that it's even the thing that favors, uh, that, that decisions going his way is absurd because there has been bouts, in my opinion, that he's lost, clearly lost. Which ones? Uh, Laura, I thought he lost. I thought he lost, obviously, with Floyd Mayweather, that he got a draw on from on one, one decision. On one card, yeah. On one card. Um, and I thought he lost both fights with... Um, so you got to be better than Laura. I have to be better than Laura. I have to be... Uh, a great example of Floyd Mayweather in his patterns and his style, and which, which I am. And, and here's the thing, too. So 
Even though he is one of the best fighters that I'm facing, I am also a very challenging task for Golovkin, um, for Canelo, because he has never seen anything like me inside the ring. He might have faced similarities, maybe in height or maybe in power and, or, or skill, but not all of those things all together in one night. So it's going to be some, some challenges he's going to face that night. There are lots of things you do very well. Yeah. There are also lots of things he does very well. He has a great chin. He's a good defensive fighter. Even when he's being aggressive, he's learned to be a more effective, aggressive fighter. He's a savage body puncher. I love it. What's the game plan? Game plan is to go in there and do whatever it takes to win. That's really it. I mean, I have grit. I have seen the bottom of the bottom. There's no reason for me not to go in there and not put my best foot forward. So all of this, I mean, even the Mexican chants. We were at the press conference yesterday, and they were chanting his name, and I just got like, mm, I want it. I'm so inspired by this. I'm so motivated by this. I must be king. And if you do somehow get by Canelo and, uh, and get out of there with a win, mm -hmm. not just in a good fight, oh, <laughs> Daniel Jacobs, oh, he came up, maybe right. he won the fight, but Canelo got, but if you actually win officially, right. Demetrius Andrade is out there, mm -hmm. Callum Smith, mm -hmm. in a heavier weight class, you plan on staying at middleweight? Is there unfinished business at middleweight? Do you want to prove oh, of swimming with these sharks in a very deep <laughs> division that you are the baddest dude? Absolutely. Are you looking north at super middleweight? You are a big middleweight? So here's the thing. I'm grateful to be in this position that I'm in because the middleweight division is so stacked right now. I mean, me and Canelo are champions, but there's still another champion out there. So the fact that we have options and the fact that Golovkin's still out there and he wants a belt and he's needing of an opportunity to prove himself there's other options. So for me, securing this victory, hopefully they want another rematch when we do a rematch, we look for other options. But I'm not thinking of anything else after this until it actually happens. Because this is a dream fight for me. This is a dream come true to get this fight of this status, the fight of this caliber, the fight of this talent level. So Canelo offers all of that and my focus cannot, it would be disrespectful to even think about anybody else after him. Last one. Yeah. Have you improved since the Golovkin fight? Can you fight better than that, and how? I have improved uh, experience-wise, um, but in just my last couple of fights, I had to use my experience in different ways. So you've seen different styles that I've brought to the table in all my last, by the way, I fought three undefeated guys in a row, um, that no one really want, that the road that I took, no one wants to take. That's right. And I showed different styles of myself. So if you haven't seen the best Daniel Jacobs, you're going to see me put all of those things together May 4th, because I have to, in order to go against a guy like this, with this caliber, with this skill level, with the resentless, that he, the, the mindset that he has, and with Vegas on the side. <laughs> so I have to make sure that I... Uh, put my best foot forward and go in there. And if I can stop him, then it's no question uh, whatsoever. Yeah, I lied. It's one yeah. more. You think you can knock him out? I do believe I can knock him out. I think I can be the only one to knock him out. Golovkin hit him uh, uh, with some good shots. He was able to take it. But he's seen all the shots that Golovkin hit him with. I'm a faster guy with, I won't say more, but just as much power as Golovkin. So if you can't see the things that come with the power and velocity in that, which I throw him, and that's going to be a long life. As you know from your life experience, the yeah. shot that, hit, that hurts you is the one you don't see coming, Absolutely. right? And then the question is, can you get up? And you got up, and you're making New York proud. Daniel Thank Jacobs, you. thanks for coming on. I appreciate you. Thank you.